Thank you. Uh, we've asked the winners uh, coming up to say a little bit more than thanks uh, in their remarks. So just wanted you to know that. Um, the uh, category we're doing now is National Network Program. Our first winner, now on PBS, was recognized for meticulous reporting and for seeing the issues through voters' eyes and experiences. In this excerpt, Maria Inahosa interviews Bill Richardson in a report that explains why New Mexico, a state with only five electoral votes, is crucial to modern presidential elections. This is New Mexico, the battleground of battleground states. Michelle Obama has been here three times this year, Barack five. And New Mexico is a battleground state. This state is critical. And John McCain has come here three times, once with running mate Sarah Palin. We must win New Mexico. We need your support. Both sides are fighting hard for these voters, but with only five electoral votes, why such a focus on a southwestern state? Governor, why has New Mexico become such a critical state? It wasn't always that way, so what's changed? Well, New Mexico's very independent. Every four years it goes by 1% to one party, then to another party, generally Republican. But it's become so important because presidential elections, at least the last three, have been so close. So as goes New Mexico, as goes small states like Colorado and Nevada and New Mexico combined, that's the presidency. Democratic Governor Bill Richardson, who had been a presidential contender himself this year, says the results in New Mexico are as close as you can get. In fact, in the summer political movie Swing Vote, starring Kevin Costner, the entire election comes down to one voter here in New Mexico. So we, one American citizen, will effectively choose the next president of the United States. The truth is almost as dramatic. Al Gore won New Mexico by a hair in 2000, only 366 votes, the closest race in the nation. Hello, New Mexico, how are you? So in 2004, the pressure was on Governor Richardson to deliver the state for John Kerry. While the counting was still going on, Kerry was interviewed by an Albuquerque news station and caught off guard. Listen closely. Bill Richardson better deliver. But in the end, it didn't happen. In the final count, the state went red for George W. Bush by fewer than 6,000 votes. I still have arrows from not delivering it four years ago. We lost it by 1%. Senator Kerry is still mad at me. This election, Richardson's pushing a new strategy. The key to winning, he says, is what he calls the New West. You look at the calculations. John Kerry, had he won New Mexico, Nevada, Colorado, he'd be president today, even if he'd lost Ohio. Accepting the award is the host of Now on PBS, David Brancaccio. Put on one of them John Kerry smiles. <laughs> What'd you say? I could say thank you and leave. Thank you very much. <laughs> Did you see the New Yorker magazine has that uh, contest for the cartoons? We enter all the time and don't even show up in the uh, top three. It really annoys me. But one very apt to our earlier discussion about uh, the future of newspapers, if any. Did you see the one? It's a couple sitting in their living room. And each has in his hand not a newspaper, but in fact an engraved tablet. And number two and number three suggestions for the caption were terrible, but the winner for once was actually very, very good. The caption that won read, well, newsprint is fine, but I'll never give up the look and feel of engraved stone. <laughs> Sincerely sorry that Maria is not here. She had the plane tickets and was headed out the door to join us this morning, but she hurt herself in the kitchen. She actually uh, burned her hand. Um, she's okay. I talked to her earlier today, but her husband, Herman, and Maria talked about it and thought it might just be a better day, despite the honor here, to just 
catch her breath after that. But uh, she wanted me to extend her sincerest thanks and appreciation for being honored this way. Maria and I are you know, running all over the country on these political stories, and uh, she is indefatigable. Marty had talking points for me, okay, for all of us perhaps. So he said, Walter Cronkite, well, I'm the guy who as an undergrad organized all the chairs and found the television set so we could all sit down and watch Walter's last regularly scheduled CBS Evening News broadcast. This is a deep honor for me to, uh, to be associated with uh, a person many of us still regard as Uncle Walter. Marty said, say hi to the wonderful, hardworking students. What your professors are telling you about multimedia is true. Did you see, look, Mr. Fox over here, look, he knows, he knows how to operate a camera. I'm the one who installed Pro Tools in our operation. It's a lot of competition, but that obviously is the wave of the future. Uh, and uh, I would add to the ability to be fluent in whatever technology sends our way is to embrace storytelling. That's how these stories, every single one of the ones we've seen featured here this afternoon, that is the heart of these stories. Because you can show a lot of PowerPoint presentations, but what we know from research is that the information people retain are human stories. So if you can tell stories, your stories will have impact. I also wanted to pass along to you a sense of hope. My program, if you've ever seen it on a Friday night, is very substantial. We once got a letter from a viewer that says, look, we love now on PBS, we would never miss it. We all gather around our electronic hearth on a Friday night as a family to watch. But could you ever give us anything to live for? <laughs> you know, we don't call you now. In our family, we call you kill me now. <laughs> I think because of the meatiness of our, our fare. Now, I actually took that to heart, and we've had an editorial response on the air, which is each and every one, each and every one of our pieces, if you look, lifts up at least one hero, a person who is not just sitting there, as my grandmother would say, kvetching about the world, but doing something to realize a vision of the world as a better place. We also do stories that uh, reward good behavior, almost in the sense of what this award ceremony is trying to do, lift up good behavior. And the question is, does anybody watch such a thing? A little PBS show on a Friday night? Well, we don't have the audience of Katie. We don't have the audience of George. But we beat everything on cable television. I mean, the O'Reillys, all those pseudo journalists, uh, we have uh, an audience of two and a half million people who sit there on a busy Friday night when the entire culture competes for their attention to feed the mind, to embrace policy for a few minutes. And what we know from the research on our audience is they are, as a group, what we call change agents. These are people who will take the information that we try to provide in an accurate way and run with it. It's not our job to tell them exactly what to do with our information, but they really do. And there is a market for this out there. Um, and working at our outfit is a bit like, you ever see the TV show The West Wing? It's a bit like that, but in a newsroom. Everybody's overly briefed. We have those hallway conversations as we're walking. Everybody's persuaded that we are, in fact, changing the world at any given time. Not positive every single broadcast does that, but we certainly try. So there are places out there for you that have that kind of audience. A little bit of an open question. I alluded to it earlier. Is, is there a business model to support that? Because despite the large audience, there's still question marks over how financially sustainable how our work is. Last thing, I've spent a lot of time overseas. I've spent a lot of time, uh, for instance, going to school in, of all places, weirdly, Madagascar. I went to high school for a while. Ghana, I went to college for a while. And I'm a bit of an amateur student of Proverbs. And one of my favorite ones both applies to this group gathered here, but also, I think, to the difference between what I think real journalism and the pseudo-journalism that sometimes goes on online. It's simply this. It's from the Akan-speaking people in Ghana. And they say, say this. They say, one must come out of one's house to begin learning. That's where the real journalism is, when you get out from behind the cherry anchor desk and you get out in the world to connect with real people on the cutting edge of journalism. Thank you very much for this honor.